last trip through Jonah. <laughs> Gosh. Speaking of a trip, isn't he a trip? I mean, you, you've heard me talk about this guy, and we've gone through, you know, the first three chapters and whatnot, and then we got, uh, you know, this last section here right here. But, I mean, I've already done r reviews and taken us into the... What's going on here, buddy? I don't know. What is that? Oh. oh. <laughs> I was wondering, wondering what all that limping was all about. Okay. Welcome, welcome. In any case, we're going to talk today about Jonah's demented demand for death. Yep. Took me a while to come up with that, but there it is. I think it pretty much captures the fourth chapter. Ah, uh, let's just read through. It's, you know, you can see that this is these chapters are short. Let's just read through that fourth chapter together. Get a little overview going, and then we'll slip through this thing. Now, as you remember from last week in the third chapter, Jonah does repent of a sorts. God had to, to say the least, force him into it. Time to spend three days and three nights in the belly of a giant fish. <coughs> Jonah repents, gets his second chance at the beginning of the third chapter, goes in. We're told that Nineveh is a three-day walk to get through. Goes in about a day, begins to preach. Now, I told you last week, maybe he spends all three days preaching through. Maybe he just goes so far. I get the feeling that he's doing the job minimum, as it were, because you know he doesn't really want to do this. That's how it was from the beginning. God gives him an assignment, and he doesn't want to do it. But he's so extreme about it. And I was thinking this morning, you know, Jonah couldn't even be a member of our church. You realize that? Because you, in order to be a member of, of the church, you've got to, like, be an actual Christian. You've got to have a credible profession of faith. Well, where's his profession? I don't know. You know, uh, there has to be submission. Well, there's hardly any submission going on here. Jonah is really just gone. I mean, just... I don't know what to say about him. And, and we're going to talk about the way this, this book ends uh, when we get close to the ending right here. Uh, I, I mentioned to you, I think, maybe last week or something like that. What we've got here is what's essentially called a suspended ending. Um, you'll see what I mean when we get through it. But let's just, let's just do this uh, fourth chapter. The people repent, and this torques Jonah off. Can you imagine? Uh, it's like, what if God called you to do this evangelistic campaign throughout Omaha, and the entire city repented. The entire city came to Christ, and that ticked you off. What? What? Okay, fourth chapter. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. And the Lord said, Do you have a good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city, sat on the east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. And the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand, as well as many animals? And you turn the page, and oh, it's time for Micah. Wait, what kind of an ending is this? Who was Jonah's editor? Who let this go by? Nobody ends a book like this. 
Actually, there are several suspended endings like this throughout the Old and the New Testament. And I'm going to point some out at the end of this whole thing. And it's there for a reason. And we'll talk about that reason when we get to that point. Let's consider the outline here and let's break this down into three sections. First, we're going to look at Jonah's demand for death detailed. And we'll jump right into that. There are details as to why Jonah thinks that God ought to just take him out. I mean, can you, I, I don't, we've talked about Jonah's, you know, he's a bigot. That's just all there is to it. He hates the Assyrians. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. You know, these people are already marauding against uh, the, the northern uh, kingdom. Uh, you know, and Jonah's a prophet from the northern kingdom. And uh, these are vile people, you know, and they're coming against God's people, even though the northern kingdom is largely polytheistic. Remember that? Just loads of different gods, the Canaanite gods they brought in, all goes back to their first king, you know. And, uh, but he hates these people. Lastly, he just wants God to deal with them, to wipe them out. Let's talk about Jonah's demand for death and how it's detailed. Chapter 4 and verse 1, But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Of course, that's referring back to the last verse in the third chapter. The people had repented. God turned from, uh, uh, relented concerning the calamity which he was going to bring on them, didn't do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah. The Hebrew word there for displease is ra'ach, ra'ach. It, it's just evil. It, he was greatly evil affected. He thought it was a great evil, and his resort or his retort to that was that he became very angry. He became very charach. He burned in his anger. You know how that burning, you know, the word talks about how that sometimes God burns in his anger. Of course, this is a very holy, righteous burning and indignation. And whenever something begins to burn, it starts off slow as a, as a small ember, and then it begins to catch fire and get worse and worse and that kind of a thing. The more Jonah thought about this and how he had gone through this entire scenario of being sucked up by the sea monster, going through that giant storm, you know, it's like... Well, this is exactly, he's thinking in his head, you know, like, like none of us do this. God, I told you. I told you. I knew this was going to happen. And I mean, he's completely disconnected from the heart of God. Completely disconnected, but he's a prophet. Isn't it interesting? God could have gotten somebody else to do the job. You know, we hear that every now and then. Somebody will say, you know, well, if I said no to God, God just showed me that, you know, he'd use somebody else or he'd get somebody else to do it, you know, kind of. But isn't it interesting that that's not the case here in Jonah? God handpicked Jonah for this job. That's why I told you last week, I think the book of Jonah is just as much about Jonah himself and God dealing with Jonah as it is about bringing the Ninevites to repentance. And so, oh my gosh, here's Jonah, you know, and God says, I'm going to use you and that's it. And God never relents. He doesn't stop you know, in regards to the person that he has chosen. That's a real good lesson for all of us in the church. You know, uh, God doesn't relent when he puts his hand on you, not just for a call uh, for uh, some ministry thing, but for salvation in particular. God hunts down his elect. And the same thing is true in regards to who he's going to use for ministry. If he taps you for it, he's not going to go, oh, you don't want to do it? Okay, that's cool. Because God doesn't say that's cool. We say that's cool. Oh, oh, that's cool. Oh, I'll get Mary Rhodes to do it. Oh, I'll get Mary Stearns to do it. I'll get Frank. Oh, it'll be fine. You know, sit down, relax. It's a... No, it doesn't work that way. Because God's got plans for training you through this call to ministry, service, whatever it might be. See, it's, it all works together. And so here's Jonah. Talk about the wrong attitude. I mean, that's the least we could say about it. He's burning with this anger. And then he turns in this attitude of anger. And in verse 2, he starts to pray. Now, we're talking about Jonah's demand for death and how it's detailed. Jonah is going to detail this demand, okay? Verse 2, and it says, And he prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord. <laughs> you ever done that with the Lord? Please. It's something that you, you didn't want to happen, or you know, it's like, kind of like, Lord, I told you this was going to happen. Like, we know more than God. I told, and we go, please, Lord, like he's supposed to like have compassion on us because we're, you know, rebelling against him, you know, but we think we're in the right. Please, Lord, he says, was not this what I said what I, when I was in my own country? In other words, what that informs us of is back in the first chapter, when God calls him to go to Nineveh and preach, the text just says, 
in verse 3 of chapter 1, so Jonah just rose up and fled to Tarshish. But now Jonah is telling us, God and I had a conversation about this initial call to go to Nineveh. Now he's saying, was this not, for, for two, was this not what I said, what I said when I was in my own country? Let me remind you, God, about the conversation that we had. You know, maybe you just forgot, you know. I'm willing to let it go. You know, maybe you made a little bit of a mistake here. But isn't this what I said? In other words, in other words, this is what I told you. I told you this was going to happen. I told you. Why are you sending me out there? If you're not going to blow them away, why are you sending me out there? This is what I said in my own country. So this first detail is Jonah thinks he's right. God's wrong. I was right. I was right to run. I told you so. Then he gets into this second part, middle of verse 2. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God. In order, New American Standard says, in order to forestall this, in order to put this off, because I knew you were going to have mercy, and I don't want you to have mercy. Now, I'm sure none of us ever have felt that way about somebody, something. What do you suppose uh, the majority of the Christians over here felt about the Nazis during World War II? Little, little uh, relating thing here for just a second. God, just blow them away. If God, God he could just, that, that Hitler guy, just give him a heart attack. Don't look at me like you're shocked because everybody thinks that way from time to time, depending upon how serious. All right, what about the, the threat of Muslim terrorists for us today? The anniversary to 9-11 just came and went. How do you feel about those people? What if God sends you, you know, d does God want to send the gospel through specific people over to the Middle East to minister the word to those people, the threat of death? You know how crazy they all are in regards to this. God, just blow them away. God could deal. Why did God allow, you know, whatever your opinion is, whether it was an inside job or not, the Twin Towers and thousands of people died as well as the folks on that airplane that got ditched in, in Pennsylvania. And the threat is always looming over us. But if God would just take these people out. You know, God has a purpose for evil. Isaiah 45, 7, God says he creates the light and the darkness and he creates evil. That means he controls it, he has a plan for it. It's there for his purpose. It's there to glorify him ultimately and bring his purposes to pass. Just because you and I don't get it doesn't mean it isn't true. The light is never... Uh, lighter than in the darkest of places. And so, he says in the middle of two, in order to forestall this, to put off God's mercy, having mercy on the Ninevites, because I knew, now this is so damning for Jonah, I knew you were a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. I knew this about you. Now, now this, this statement is made about God, and God makes this about himself in several places in Scripture, that God is gracious, compassionate, uh, slow to anger. But don't, Jonah didn't want him to be slow to anger. Jonah wanted him to get hot and just blow off the, the top and get rid of these Ninevites, right? And abundant in loving kindness. Now, you can locate that if you want to take a note. Passages like Exodus 34, verse 6 say that. Exodus 34, 6. Also, Numbers 14, verse 18. Numbers 14, verse 18. You may even have it in the margin of your Bible. Um, not, not difficult to find this kind of stuff. The thing is, is that Jonah knew the Scripture about this. We already know Jonah was, was very well aware of the Scriptures, and he's accountable for what he knows, because in the third chapter, remember, he was quoting from several of the Psalms as we went through that. He knew what the word meant. He even ends his prayer with the absolutely righteous statement, salvation is of the Lord. And that's it. That, is, that is one of the, the key theme statements for the entire Bible. Salvation is of the Lord. See, he's accountable for what he knows, which makes this all the worse. Finally, this last detail he gives at the bottom of verse 2, he says about God that he is one who relents concerning calamity 
this evil destruction that he wanted God to bring on the Ninevites. Now the word relent there, maybe you have repent or something like that. It's nachem in Hebrew, and it means to be moved to compassion. I knew you would be moved to compassion concerning this calamity. These are supposed to be reasons. Think of this. Do you, do you think he's selling God yet? You know, he better take a course, Dale Carnegie or something, because he's not selling anybody. These are weak. These are weak reasons. But can you imagine standing up? You know, you're Jonah, and you're... And God is talking to you, and you're standing up to him, and you're telling him, these are my reasons why we shouldn't have done this. But I can't get you to go my way, so just kill me. Three times in the book of Jonah, I said three times, I held up four fingers, there you go. Three (laughs) times, that's how this day is going to go. Three times in the book of Jonah, this comes up. I'll come back to that in just a second. Verse three, therefore, therefore, in conclusion, O Lord, O Yahuwah, using his covenantal name, please take my life, nefesh, my soul from me, for death is better for me than life. David said in Psalm 63 and verse 3, he says, your loving kindness is better to me than life. My lips shall praise you, thus will I bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. But Jonah says, it's better to die. (laughs) Death is better for me than life. Psalm 63, verse 3, where David says the opposite. Now, we've already seen in chapter 1, verses 11, verses 12, he's in the midst of this storm. The, the sailors say, what do we do to get this thing to stop? You know, and they already knew he was running from God's command. So here we've got these unregenerate pagan Gentiles. They're polytheists. They don't know God from, you know, Jonah had an opportunity on the boat. But see, Jonah doesn't care. Jonah's hard-hearted. Prophet of God, great. Jonah's got, you know, he, uh, to say the least, incredibly selfish. I mean, we can draw these conclusions. These are not, these are not you know, just random conclusions just because like maybe Burks doesn't like Jonah or something like that. No, that's not the case. I think you can pull this stuff right from the text. I don't think anybody would argue against this, and I don't know why you would. So when they say to him in chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, what do we do to stop this storm? Because they already knew that God brought it on because Jonah was running, and he says, kill me in verse 12. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. And I said to you, why didn't he just jump in? Why doesn't he just jump? Probably knew the prohibition against murder, self-murder, suicide, in the commandments. But he, he, he wouldn't even take responsibility for that. The man is irresponsible. Isn't that something? But God used him anyway. Now, that's not to say it's okay to be irresponsible. God, you know, he will still use you and you'll have his approval. No, 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 no. This is a... This is a giant, it's like it's flashing on the silver screen how not to be in service to God and and think that you are okay with God. Because Jonah, you you know, you have to think you're you're pretty self-righteous in order to stand up to God and say, isn't this what I told you what would happen? What? You've got to think pretty highly of yourself. And you're thinking very wrongly of yourself, of course. Better for me to die. So then the Lord asked him this question, verse 4. The Lord said, Do you have a good reason to be angry? 5. Then Jonah went out from the city, sat east of it. In other words, did you notice here? God asked him a question in verse 4. Do you have a good reason to be angry? Because these other reasons you've just given me in verse 2, they stink. They're hardly good. So what is? Don't you even have one good reason? Notice that Jonah does not answer him. That's why I read verse 5 to you right then the top of verse 5. Jonah just turns on his heel and walks away from God. Jonah knows he doesn't have a a good reason. Or Jonah might even be, I don't want to go too far into this might stuff, but I mean, he's already laid out his thing. He's already had the gall to say, isn't this what I told you what would happen? Therefore, in order to forestall this mercy of yours, I fled to Tarshish. And Jonah might even been thinking, oh, throw his hands up in the air, walk away. I don't know. Maybe. Wouldn't put it past him. What an attitude. Do you have a good reason to be angry? Now, I want to, I want to inform you, that's the first point. Jonah's demand for death detail. These are his details of why I, I think God should kill me. You know, just take me out of all this. I'd rather die than to see, you know, we, we've heard that before. Uh, 
maybe a, a, a mom or a dad is like completely, you know, maybe totally opposed to the, the guy or the gal that their child is going to marry. And mom or dad might say, just kill me, you know, I'd rather die than is you marry this person. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's that kind of a thing. And so when he says to Jonah, when God says to Jonah in verse 4, don't you have a good reason to be angry? Uh, God's going to return to this because of the second point of our text here, of our outline dealing with verses 5 down to 9, is actually God putting Jonah in a position where Jonah has to answer this question. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting form of discipline. It's not really punishment per se. It's an interesting form of discipline that God's going to take him through uh, on a little overnight journey there on the east side of the city. And I want you to notice three things, that God appointed three different things. And I want you to notice the word appointed as it first shows up in verse uh, 6. So the Lord God appointed a plant. I just underlined that. He appointed a plant. Verse 7, God appointed a worm. Third, verse 8, God appointed a scorching east wind. Three appointments. Three appointments. Jonah may be uncaring, unthankful, but God is thoroughly committed to Jonah. He's taking him through this discipline. You or I, if we could even begin to to fathom and say this, if we were God, I know for me, I would have been like, Jonah, you're going to run from me? Later. The second he ran and got on that boat and took off to Tarshish, it'd be like, done. You don't want to find... I mean, think about it for a second. What if somebody in our church, you know, I, I tapped somebody to, to do something. I needed you to, to do a little something. And you agreed to do it. You know, and then I said, okay, you, you start, you know, this Sunday or whatever like that. And then it's like you don't do it. And then you actually don't even come to church. I, you know, I'm just saying. I don't see you. It's like, where you're not answering your phone. And it's like... And then I find out, well, somebody tells me, oh, they didn't really want to do what you asked them to do, so they moved out of town. <laughs> Later, I'll get somebody, sure, you know that's what I would do. But see, God's bigger, he's better, gracious, just like Jonah knew, loving compassion, slow to anger, quick to forgive. Um, God loves his elect. And I, I, I have no reason to believe that Jonah was not, because look at the extent that God is willing to go with this man to train him, and hopefully to change him. That's why the suspended ending at the, at the end of this is so powerful, because it makes us ask all kinds of questions. Wait, wait till we get there. Okay. So let's move from Jonah's demand for death being detailed to, secondly, Jonah's demand for death through discomfort. God's really drawing, you know, the, the selfish thing and the self-righteous thing right out of Jonah. And he's making him very uncomfortable through the day and through the night in regards to this. Verse 5. So Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. By the way, um, if he sat east of it, if you, if you looked in, the, in your, uh, your map, maybe back of your Bible or something like that, and you find Nineveh, uh, on the map, you'll see it's about 500 miles. So here's the coast of, here's where, you know, some kind of an overhead map will work great right now. Here's the coast of the Mediterranean, and Jonah got barfed up by the whale on the coast. And so now he's got about a 500 mile trek to get over to Nineveh, see? So he gets there, that means he's entering Nineveh from the west side, isn't he? That isn't interesting. The text says that he went out of the city and sat east of it. Um, I don't want to push it too far, uh, but it seems to me reasonable to understand that if he entered the city from the west side and the people have now repented uh, and he only went in maybe so far, maybe it's possible, you know, if he wanted to leave the city, he'd have just, you know, hung a 180 and headed out through the way he came in, possibly. On the other hand, I don't know, he ends up on the far east side. So we know he did do the whole walk through the place and ends up on the, on the east side of the city. So I don't know, maybe he did preach the, through, through the whole thing. Or maybe the word just carried, like the text in chapter 3 seems to indicate, it even got to the king. Eventually the word got to the king about Jonah's 
prophets. In any case, he's over on the east side right now. And it says, There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade. Isn't that nice? Shelter, shade. Until he could see what would happen in the city. Until he could see what would happen in the city. Now, he just told God how, how wrong God was. He's all mad. You know, God's having compassion on this people. The people have repented. And yet, look at Jonah. He's holding out. He's holding out for what? What do you think he's hanging around for? Yeah, he, he's hanging around for the same thing that, you know, we hang around for, the park, uh, the darker it gets on the 4th of July. You're waiting for the fireworks. He's, he's hoping that this thing is going to blow anyway. This is God's choice. This is God's man. Does this trek through Jonah make you not want to be like Jonah? For sure, that's how it is with me. These are like bullet points of me to watch out for in regards to my attitude and you know the way I choose to respond to God. It really makes me think about this. In fact, it quite frankly, it reminds us, me of, of the way I've talked to God you know, at various times over the years. You know, it's like, I mean, I can't say, well, Jonah, man, I'm glad I'm not like Jonah. No, 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 I think I am like Jonah. But if it wasn't for the grace of God working on me and changing me, I'd be like this all the time. I'd be some self-righteous, ridiculous bigot. And so he sits under the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. Notice that in the middle of five, he makes this shelter for himself. So he, he does a little bit of work. But the shelter is really going to be insufficient to really kind of uh, keep him from you know, the kind of discomfort that the sun and then the scorching wind is going to bring. This shelter is not going to hold up to this Scirocco-type wind that's about, about to come. But I want you to see he's, he's doing for himself for his own comfort. Because people who think they can talk to God, like Jonah are real sure to make sure that they are comfortable. They make sure of that, their own comfort. Somebody else may go without some needs being met, but I just sort of turn my head and close my eyes to that. You know, I forget the proverb, the citation, but there's a proverb that says, uh, he who doesn't, who, who doesn't have mercy on the poor you know, will, will have his light put out in abject darkness. When you turn your eyes away from people in needs is the idea. And so, here we go, he's made a little shelter for himself, and he's waiting to see what's going to happen to the city. He's waiting for the fireworks. He think, Is this some kind of entertainment for him? So how does God respond to this? Well, he begins to deal with his servant. He doesn't leave him alone. God's so loving, he won't leave us in our bigotry, our sin, our stupidity, you know? He starts dealing with us. He, it's clear that Jonah won't respond to the direct word from God. He's not responding to it, is he? So God deals with him where he's at. Jonah is in a dark place. He's in a dark place. He was in a dark place from the first chapter on. And that, that whole series of repentance right there in the second chapter, that prayer and everything like that, there's no atheist in a foxhole, friends. I am, I'm quite convinced that this is where most of this was coming from. I'm not saying... God didn't inspire it or something like that because here it is, you know, in the text, and I consider Jonah inspired, of course, you know, uh, and we went through this and we saw some really great parallels between Christ and Jonah. Remember that whole teaching in the second chapter? And that's all very legitimate. But here he is crying out in this hall. He just wants to get out of this trouble. He wants to get out. It's it interesting. The guy three times in the book of Jonah asked to be killed. And when he's in the belly of the whale and he's not dead yet, He's not dead yet. He wants to get out of that. But if he was dead, that would pretty much be what he wanted. But now he's suffering. See, Jonah doesn't like to suffer. I find that people who disobey God and are bigots and are thinking more about themselves and taking care of their own shelters, they're the ones, they're the ones who are mostly so concerned with themselves. Uh, they're the ones that, you know, it's like, I just don't want to suffer. Don't let me suffer. Well, I'm not saying suffering, you know, is fun or anything like that. But I mean, it's like, whew, the last thing they want is this, and these are the kind of people these guys are. Verse 6, so here's the first appointment. So the Lord God appointed a plant 
Yeah, interesting. Uh, and it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plan. So the shelter that he made in verse 5 was insufficient. This is the shelter he made for himself. But when God makes it, provides this plant, he's very happy. So what God does is highly sufficient. But God's about to take this away from him, too. He doesn't know this is coming. But he appoints the plant to do its job. So he appoints that which makes Jonah comfortable. I find this to be the case with rebellious Christians sometimes, and God has to deal with them in regards to discipline. He'll put them in a comfortable place. Everything's going good. Got plenty of money. Health is good. Blah, 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 blah. Right? He appoints that. He sets them up for that so that he can impact them at where they're at with a full understanding about the depth of their sin. Yes, it will lead to repentance, but the idea is for you to know the offense and the sin you know, that we've put God through, as it were. So God appoints this plant. Jonah is very happy about this. Verse 7, God next appoints a worm. He appoints the very thing to destroy the thing that he made and appointed for Jonah. And by the way, this plant, you know, lots of commentators, all kinds of guesses. The, maybe, I mean, maybe you've heard of the castor oil plant. That's kind of common in those days. But I say, you know, it could be any kind of plant because God's appointing it. It's, it seems to be set apart uh, as opposed to one of the normal plants that would be in the vicinity. God's doing something else with it. So we really don't know what kind of plant this was. And I, I think that God, you know, pretty much created it on the spot, but that's just my opinion on the matter. Verse 7, And God appointed a worm, not worms, but a worm, when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant and withered it. Job said in Job 1, starting at verse 20 through 22, Job 1, 20 through 22, after he lost all of his property, right, lost all of his property, lost his children, and he said, he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Wait, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. All right, now wait. That does not necessarily mean that you have to jump the conclusion that if you have something you really want, God's going to take it away. No, 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 no. God's in charge. God's in charge. He's in control. The Lord gives, and the same sovereign control that he has in giving you uh, what you need, what you desire, you know, the same sovereign control removes it. And, and the whole emphasis on that Job 1, 20 through 22 thing is not really on the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. It's on the next part, which is, there, you guys knew that. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Either way, I praise the Lord. Either way, complete submission, totally unlike Jonah. <laughs> And Jonah didn't go through even a, a, a scintilla of what Job went through. Suffering. Mental torment, losing his family, losing his livelihood, losing his future, all this taken away. From, and now his health is shot. As a direct result of a, of a satanic attack. Moderated by God. Jonah doesn't even have any place to comment. But let's see how Jonah deals with this excess of heat. If you've ever lived in uh, maybe Arizona or some really hot uh, desert area or something like that, oh my gosh. I mean, we think we get it bad over here. But God appointed a worm when the dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and withered. Third appointment, verse 8. And when, God, when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind. Have you ever experienced anything like that in the desert where it's so hot anyway, and here comes this wind, it's just like tearing through you. Oh, my God. We have this Mojave situation uh, in, uh, in California. And, uh, oh, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, so here comes this scorching east wind. God's appointed it all. God appointed the plant, verse 6, and, and it made Jonah very happy. Bottom of verse 6, right? God appoints uh, the uh, worm to take away the plant. In, in verse 7, and then verse 8, so now all he's got is the shelter that he built. It doesn't say God blew away the shelter, right? All he's got is the shelter, this thing that he made. Clearly it's insufficient to stop this, this scorching east wind. So whatever Jonah did has no effect on really providing his comfort, his happiness, or anything like that. What do you think God is saying to Jonah here? Yeah, Jonah goes through 
preaches to the city, is probably thinking that through his preaching they repented. And it's kind of half-hearted, for sure. But he did what God, he did the bare minimum, what God told him to do. But Jonah's thinking, I did this, probably, to, to a greater or lesser degree. But it's insufficient. It's insufficient. It's like, he, I've done my job, kind of a thing. But you see, Jonah can't see that this whole Nineveh campaign was just as much about him and about God dealing with him and taking him through this whole thing. You know, I don't think the whole get thrown into the belly of the whale thing is the result of his disobedience as much as God planned this whole scenario out strictly for Jonah. And the Ninevites you know, got the tasty end of it in regards to the cherry on top. They repented. I think this was more about Jonah than anything else, what God put him through because of this great love wherewith he loved him. He appoints the scorching east wind, verse 8, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint. Have you ever had that happen? You've been outside, it's just so hot, you just... He became faint and begged with all his soul to die. Man, <clears throat> when we played a gig this uh, July 6th, I believe it was, honey, at South Point Pavilion uh, down in Lincoln, and this stage, I, I've told you some of you guys about this. This has never happened before in my entire life. I played lots of outdoor jobs before. During the summer, this is a first. Of course, maybe my age now has something to do with this. But whatever. We're outside. We're in this. The, the, the stage is set up, and there's buildings around here. And then this one gap between the buildings and the sun is right there. And it's like hammering on this stage. I have never been in this kind of physical exhaustion. I was going to say pain. I really wasn't in pain so much. It was just like, I can't do this. You know, I, I don't think I can play one more lick. I can't lift my stick one more time, right? And, and it's just beating down on me. And, you know, Carrie's like watching me and everything. As soon as when I play, terrible, you know. And then as soon as that set was over, boom, I dropped my sticks. And I walked over to where Carrie is. I flopped down up against her knees. And she's just pouring water on me. I'm drinking water. We have bottled water this kind of a thing, and I'm just trying to get back, and I'm praying, you know, and I'm, I'm claiming scripture, you know, and, and, and I f did feel better, and the second set was a whole lot better. I, I felt, we all felt better. Uh, our band leader, uh, Pat Delaney, he says uh, to the band at one of the rehearsals after, afterwards, he says, did any of you guys, sorry, I don't mean to, you know, did any of you guys like throw up, you know? He says, I went home and threw up. Well, that, you know, that can be serious, you know, uh, stroking on the heat thing, you know, the sunstroke routine. Uh, that's how bad it was. It was affecting us all. But, like, you know, I'm like the workhorse. Um, I, I, and here's Jonah. He became faint <laughs> and begged with all his soul to die. Not heal me. Not, Lord, what is wrong here? Or how do I need to, you know, what do I need to be thinking? How do I need to repent? No, just kill me. See, they just want, they don't want to deal with it. Just kill me. Just take me out of it. I've known Christians that are like this. Just, you know, I don't want to deal with it. Take me out. But God's more concerned about you as his finished product, even so much that uh, if your comfort is something um, that is getting in the way, then let's just be uncomfortable because God wants you to be walking right, thinking right, because he's got a plan here relative to conforming you to the image of his son. So he's gone through all this. God made those three appointments. Now you remember back in verse 4? Look at verse 4 again. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Because these last reasons you gave me in verse 2, they, they stink. They stink the place up. Now we return to verse 9, and here comes the question again, after he's gone through all this. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? Now we've moved from angry about you know, God uh, bl not blowing away the Ninevites, relenting concerning all that evil, right? So now, now he switched it over to the plant because the plant was doing him good. The plant was making him comfortable. The plant, he was exceedingly happy, verse 6 says, about the plant. Now God brings it down to his level where he can understand because he just experienced this. Yeah. Do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And Jonah fires back and said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. I'm angry enough to die. 
I'm so angry. Have you ever been so angry like that? I mean, it's just, I don't know that I ever have. But he's forcing Jonah to face his sin. That's Jonah's demand for death through discomfort. I, 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 I hope God got through to him, but because of the way this ends, we can't know for sure. But let's do the last point now. Third point on your outline. Jonah's demand for death is denounced. Verse 10. Then the Lord said, You had compassion on the plant, because it just made him so happy. He had compassion on it because it did good for him. It did what he wanted. But he had zero compassion on the Ninevites. For which you did not work, for which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. You had nothing to do with this, and when it went away, you got even angrier. Anger, back to this anger thing. Enough to die. See, once it caused him discomfort, Jonah wanted to die. Oh, now it's starting to become clear. Jonah didn't want to do this Ninevite campaign. He'd rather die. It was uncomfortable for him. It made me uncomfortable. And God is now revealing this to him. He's drawing it out of him. But he had to take him through this entire scenario here, going all the way back to the first chapter, to get him to see this. Now God is drilling home the point. Just like you had nothing to do with these Ninevites, other than just obeying what I said, giving them the word that in 40 days this thing is toast. That's it. That's basically, you know, compound preaching material. There it is, boom, you know. But it was God's word, God's anointing on it, because it's his word, and it, and it circulated, went through the people. Jonah had nothing to do with that. But Jonah's thinking, you know, like he's necessary. But then, he didn't want to do it because it was making him uncomfortable, because he's a bigot. He wants these people to die. He doesn't want to trek 500 miles from the Mediterranean coast all the way inland to the capital of the Assyrian Empire. That puts me out. That throws my whole schedule for my whole week totally off. Puts me out. Selfish. Self-righteous. And now, he says, okay, a day and a night. Uh, here comes the plant, right? And then here comes... The sun, and oh, I got a worm, <clears throat> eat that thing away, it dies, it withers. This little shelter you built, you know, that you thought was cool, isn't doing the job. Here's a scorching east wind kind of a thing. Oh, I'm so miserable, I'm so miserable. He didn't really care about the misery that the Ninevites were going to go through. He didn't, let alone the suffering and torment in the torment section of Sheol, that wasn't a concern for him. And so God drills this home. With verse 10, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Here it is. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? I had compassion on you. I made that plant. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? You were just hot and uncomfortable. We're talking about eternal fire in torment section in Sheol, Luke 16, right? Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons, more than 120,000 persons. Remember I told you the, in the beginning in the intro that through various archaeological records and, and data, uh, the estimate is somewhere around 600,000. So he says there's more than that. And then he makes a reference to people in middle of verse 11 who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left. Now, when when uh, when Tony and Jen, I'm sorry. When, yeah, when when Tony and Jen get here and they bring in little Joanna, go to Joanna. Okay, you'll do this, right? And say, honey, which is your right hand? Which is your left? And if she even looks at you, you know, you still won't get your answer. What's the, what's the problem? The problem is, I guess you don't realize that she doesn't understand what you're saying. And that's why you're asking it, or you wouldn't ask it. The problem is she doesn't understand, obviously. Who are those who don't understand, don't know the difference between their right hand and their left? I think it's a, I think it's a reference to people who are, um, there's either something wrong with them mentally, or it's little children. So you get the 120,000, kind of along the lines of what Frank just suggested, and then you add children to it, and who knows how, they didn't practice birth control back then, by the way. There was no, uh, you know, we'll stop at 2.5 kids. The poor .5 kid, I don't know what to say about that kid. Maybe I'm that kid, I don't know. But, 
But, you know, we're talking three, four, five kids per couple or something like that, not to mention those who are born out of wedlock. This is not a, you know, a moral culture here in Assyria kind of a thing. And you've probably got something like the 600,000, at least at that point. But he says, should I not have had more compassion on those kinds of people? They can't discern between their right hands and their left, as well as many animals. You see, God is concerned about all of his creatures. This is not a proof text for PETA superiority, by the way. This just means that God holds his animals in high regard. And we see that in various places uh, throughout the scripture. And then, boom, it ends. Suspended ending. The, the, the whole purpose of a suspended ending is, is basically this. It makes you want more. Because don't you have questions right now? What's your first question? Did Jonah repent? It's my first question. What kind of effect did this, did Jonah get it and fall down on his face before God, sorrowing? I don't know. Gosh, I want to know. What, ah, what, did, he, did he stay there? Did, did he go back in and maybe try to help him some more? Or did he return to the land of Israel? Did he continue to be a prophet? Or did God take him out? Did God grant his request and suck his soul out of his body? I don't know. The suspended ending. Um, there's lots of them in Scripture. We're kind of out of time now. I had a whole list of them, but I'm not going to give them to you now. Um, Mark 16, verse 8. Um, that's where the Greek text ends for Mark's Gospel. In our King James Bible, we've got 12 more verses to go. It extends from verses 9 through 20, and then there's some other traditions that have come along in various manuscripts that add some, some other information as well. But, but it's a great example, Mark 16, verse 8, of a suspended ending, because the women come to the tomb. <coughs> the angels are there, but Jesus is not. The angels tell him he's risen, right? And the women, it says, flee the tomb, and they were afraid, period. Very much unlike, say, Luke and John's gospel, which give additional information about Jesus appearing, uh, even at the end of, uh, of Matthew uh, 27, 28, that whole area right there, Jesus appears to the women as they're running to go tell the twelve, right, kind of a thing. So there's a little bit of satisfaction there, right? But here, suspended ending, Mark 16, 8. Uh, they ran from the tomb and they were afraid. By the way, Mark uses that, that uh, technique uh, regarding a suspended ending, and, and people being afraid, um, full of fear as a result of something Jesus said or did or some event or something like that. You see that throughout Mark's Gospel. But it makes you think, okay, did he raise from the dead? When you look at Jonah right here at the ending, you ask these questions, and, and it's normal, by the way, to move the questions from Jonah, did Jonah repent, to this. Would I repent? That's the idea of a suspended ending. It, it, it's great. I think it's the way God made us because we turn inward by asking these questions. We're wondering about Jonah, but it doesn't take long before we start thinking, how would I react to this? What if I was Jonah? And that is the point of a suspended ending. Mark 16, 8. Nobody saw Jesus rise from the tomb. You're aware of that, right? We believe the accounts post-resurrection. Sure, scripture. Nobody was in the tomb with Jesus when he rose. Nobody saw him pass out of the cocoon-like um, uh, strips of linen you know, that were filled with uh, the various types of resin that they would use to wrap them, kind of a mummified thing. But we do have uh, John's account in John chapter 20 that when Peter and John looked in, they saw this cocoon that was wrapping him, but it was empty inside. It was like a chrysalis. You know, when a, when a, when a, butterfly, a butterfly emerges from the chrysalis and you can pick those things up, and when we were kids we crushed them and stuff like that, right? That's kind of the idea of, of what they saw right there. But nobody... See, you get the after effect. And so Mark 16, verse 8, suspended ending, the women were afraid. What were they afraid about? Well, they were told that Jesus rose. Okay, where is he? 
Where is he? And then it moves from that to, do I believe that? Do I believe that account? The text doesn't have Jesus appearing. But do I believe he did? That's the idea of a suspended ending. That's what's happening right here in Jonah, I'm pretty sure. Jonah's demented demand for death. Where does that leave us? Having gone through the four chapters of Jonah, what, does, what kind of an impact does this book have on us? That's what you need to ask yourself, and I need to ask myself in regards to this. So, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for taking us through yet another book in the Minor Prophets. Lord, we're moving along here. We've been at this for over a year, I think, uh, at this point, when we first started the Minor Prophets, and look forward to continuing uh, down the road and starting in Micah next, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, and do impact us, Lord God, with what you would say to each one of us in regards to the book of Jonah. How do we relate to this man? And we just give you thanks, Lord, for your mercy. You are gracious and all-compassionate and slow to anger, quick to forgive. Thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen.